Hey there viewers, welcome back to the shop. Today we have a 2019 Street Glide Special on the hoist. It's Dale's motorcycle, he's the service manager here at the dealership. I have a really special and interesting suspension package that we have to put on the motorcycle. It consists of rear shocks and new front fork components, uh, front springs and different fork oil. But it's a completely different setup than I've ever seen before. When I heard that this type of setup was available, it really kind of blew my mind. So I'm really excited to get it on this motorcycle and try it out. I already rode the motorcycle this morning and took it down the bumpiest road that we have here near, near the dealership. And if you have a, a touring motorcycle, I'm sure you have your own complaints about the stock suspension. So let's take a look at all the new stuff that we have and some of the really sweet technology that's built into it. So let's get to looking at that box. Here's the new suspension package. It's from Wilbur's. It's a company that I'm not familiar with, but I am now. They're in Germany. It's made in Germany. But they have a warehouse here in the United States, so shipping is quick if you want to order a kit. Just from the, just from the research that I've done, it looks like the company has been around almost 20 years, so it's a pretty well-established company and that they've been using the same type of te technology for other motorcycles in Germany for or a very long time. But let's open this box up and take a look. So it comes with obviously the owner's manual and a bunch of important information that you should read. It comes with a spanner wrench and you'll only need this once. That's the real beauty of this whole setup. It comes with new front fork springs. And these are different than normal front fork springs where they have this progressive rate where the tighter coils are. Normally in a stock suspension setup, these fit down in the bottom in the oil, but Wilbur's was very specific in the instructions that the coils should be pointing up when they're finally installed. So that's something new to remember. And then there's the fork oil. Some pretty good looking stuff. Another bottle of it. and the fork springs. Let me clean all of this up and let's take a closer look. So here's the thing that really intrigued me about this whole suspension kit, or the thing that, at least to me, since I've installed a lot of motorcycle suspensions, that really is a completely different take on normal rear shocks. So, as you saw, this suspension kit comes with front fork springs, fork oil, a conventional style looking rear shock, and then this thing. And this is a heavy duty component, like it is. It's very stout. So a viewer of mine got in contact with me. He said, hey Brad, I like your channel. I like what you do. I've used a bunch of different motorcycle suspensions, and now I've used this Wilbur's LDC, and it's a real game changer. You need to try it out. He actually kind of works a little bit with Wilbur's and he was able to line this up where we got this kit for free to try out, but I'm by no means getting a discount or being paid to make this video, so this is purely my opinion. So the thing I find super interesting about this LDC kit is this shock. It's a gas spring with a progressive curve and it adapts automatically to the load within the first thousand feet of riding the motorcycle. This is what it says in the instructions. It says that it always offers the optimal spring rate and dampening. And that there's no need to adjust anything after the initial setup. And that's something that's really important to me because being the installer, you know, the technician installing these products, I want to get the best product on the customer's bike. And then one and done, you know, set it, forget it, just be able to hop on the bike and enjoy it. I guess through my years I've started to learn that the more complicated things are is the more problems it is. Because not everybody out there in the world is a suspension expert 
you know, buying the most expensive setups that they can, twisting dials, adjusting the springs, adjusting free heist, adjusting, you know, it gets crazy. So this is something that I thought was super interesting. Basically we assemble the suspension kit on the vehicle. We do the one sag adjustment with the rider on the bike and that's it. So this street glide here, uh, the customer, which is also the service manager, like I was saying, it's Dale's motorcycle. He has a tour pack on it. He rides the bike with his wife. And the normal setup, you would know where your spring collar is, and then you'd add weight to the motorcycle, and then you'd adjust this a little bit, and then potentially turn some knobs, and then put the tour pack on, do that same thing, and then you wanna ride the motorcycle by yourself, then you undo all those things. That's a lot of taking the cell bag on and off, on and off, remembering, doing, adjusting. It's a lot of stuff to get the best ride quality. That's where this entire cylinder does all of that by itself. So the next question I had, I said, that sounds great. That sounds awesome. Automatic leveling and it's essentially ride control all in one unit no external valves or knobs or airlines or any of that business it's just a simply beautifully engineered little part so the next question i had is everything sounds excellent that's exactly what i want to hear but i also want to hear about the quality of how the thing's made or you know the manufacturing or something because so when i'm talking to customers about parts there's two things that I'm thinking of. I'm thinking about how sweet the initial thing is. This is definitely, you know, check that box. It's sweet. And then the overall lasting quality. I want the customer to purchase something and then have lasting quality with it. You know, no problems. So I started asking questions and this thing is built by ZF, the same ZF that builds transmissions for cars and has been in the automotive industry for decades. So that's pretty sweet that it's it's built and engineered by people that really know what they're doing. So I'm really glad to hear that. And then as I was reading through, the warranty card said that it has a five year worldwide warranty. So that's also good. I wanna say that's on the higher end of the time base that I've ever seen for a warranty card. So that gives me a lot of reassurance about this package. But in the instruction manual, they show how the shock works, how it has a low pressure gas chamber and then a high pressure gas chamber and a check valve and super complicated stuff. But basically, we install this on the motorcycle. We do the initial sag adjustment and that's it. So when this new LDC shock is compressed from having the tour pack on or having a passenger on, within the first thousand feet, the innards of this thing, the guts of it, pump up and adjust the height so that you still have full suspension travel, which is awesome. And then it also has that progressive rate spring curve to it so that as you need a stiffer spring for carrying more weight, it does that, which is just phenomenal. I had this little rubber boot, I was playing around with it because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just like one little seal here for water or dirt, but it's tucked up in a groove in there. And then same thing down here, it has, it's just a, it's a well-made unit. So I'm super happy to see that and get to disassembling everything and assemble it. And I'll give you my honest view and opinion of the final product along with asking the customer. So let's get going. I should say that before receiving this kit, when we talked to Wilbur's, they wanted to know, obviously, what kind and what year motorcycle we had. And also, if it's a solo ridden bike, how much you weigh, the, being the rider, how much your passenger weighs, how much you normally carry in your tour pack if you do. Because before they send this kit to us or to you or however you purchase it, it's dialed in for exactly you and your motorcycle. So it's a pretty specialized product. But for today, I just did a little quick write up as far as the torque specs that I'm going to be using. This will also be down in the description if you want to take a look at that, you know, if you're doing this at home. 
I'm also going to be doing a rebuild on the front forks. I typically recommend doing this, you know, other than a brand new motorcycle. But if the bike has any type of mileage on it, since we're going to be taking the forks apart, all of the way apart, cleaning them, and then installing new components, that way I'm assured that this front fork kit is going to be working exactly the way that it's supposed to be. This is the little tool that I use for measuring fork oil height. The instructions have a really nifty way of showing just like a cheap way of using like a little squeeze bottle with a little rubber tube, which seems pretty smart, but this is what I have. Essentially like I'll move this up and down so that this sets the desired amount of air that's in the front forks. This is how I'm gonna measure that. You know, slide it out, bing, bang, boom. I like to have a series of picks. This helps to get in and get the little snap ring out for the front fork seal. And then sometimes a little copper uh, packing seal at the bottom of the fork can be a little bit of a booger to get out. But that's what I use these for. This motorcycle is a 2019, but what I'm saying and doing is still relevant for anything 2014 to 2020. But this is a inexpensive fork seal driver. I purchased it on eBay. It's for 49 through 50 millimeter forks. I will also put a link down in the description to where you can get one of these. If you don't have one of these, I've used PVC pipe at home. It works pretty well. It's not that big of a deal, but I do a lot of front forks. This just makes it easy. It's a clamshell. You just slip it around. It has little indexing pins. Pound things together. I'm gonna use pipe dope. This is gonna assist sealing one of the copper washers at the bottom that go into the fork so it doesn't leak any oil. Always have some good blue Loctite with you. This also is just, you know, this is a little standard screwdriver. That front fork, the big plug at the top, should be a 19 millimeter Allen. This is the socket that I have. It's on a half inch drive so that I can just, this is the impact that I typically use. And it's convenient that it goes on like that. And then for the bottom screw of the front fork, it's a 12 millimeter Allen. And these type of sockets are typically fairly expensive. So I just took an Allen wrench and I cut off the, the L. And then that way just a 12 millimeter socket fits right on the end. Then it's all the 12 millimeter Allen you'll ever need. Just an inexpensive way of doing that. I'm sure you could probably do that with the 19 millimeter. I'm also gonna have some anti-seize for the front axle when we go back together. This is the type of solvent that I use. It's a low VOC multi-purpose solvent. It's from Worth. You also wanna have some, some rags. And then I'll have some microfiber things just for the final cleanup of the front forks. So let's get to working on the bike, get things started to tear down and keep on going. In projects like this, it's not necessary, but I like to remove the gas tank. It's easy enough for me to do. It's four screws, two on the front, two on the back, a quick release connector over on the fuel line. And then there's just a, a drain tube for if you overflow a vent line on the other side and then a little electrical connector that you just unplug. I like to just get it up and out of the way. That way if I'm working through here and something slips or whatever, then I don't have to worry about damaging a tank. But if you're going to be leaving your gas tank on there, you should probably put a pretty thick towel or cloth up there. But we're going to get the gas tank off and then this little trim piece here has a screw on either side and then two electrical plugs under it and then we'll get to pulling the front fender and the front brake calipers let's get going all right the fuel tank screws i just use a regular half inch socket
And then this little instrument trim panel, just right here, uses a 5 30 seconds Allen. So I have this longer one, just right here. And then it has a couple clips up at the top, so you just kind of like pull down and back. Just like that. And then there's a couple electrical connectors that you feel, feel around for. And then you unplug. Just like that. It pops off. And it gives us access to the upper fork clamps. And we already had access to the lower fork clamps, but it just makes it easier without the gas tank being here. Whenever I'm working around the front end, I like to have a front fender cover on, but especially for moments like this, because I'm going to remove the screws for the front brake caliper, and then it'll hang off to the side here until we remove the axle nut and loosen the pinch screw on the other side, and then pull the front wheel out. Because there's a little sensor here for the ABS that's zip tied to the wiring, We'll just leave that there, but we'll get that off, get this off, get the front wheel off, and then we'll use some of those rags that we have to cover up the caliper, and then just kind of push it over, and it'll just lean behind the engine guard and just give us all the room that we need to work. The tools required for the pinch screw on the other side of the axle, it's a six millimeter. The actual axle nut itself is a 15 16 The front brake caliper mounting bolts is a 12.10 millimeter. So make sure it's a 12.10 millimeter. And then once we have all of that stuff out of the way, we're gonna remove the front fender and that's a quarter inch Allen. So I'm just gonna get the impact, zip all that stuff off. I probably should have said this before, but you want to make sure that you follow the service manual. This is just the way I'm used to doing this project. But before you take off the front wheel, you want to make sure that your vehicle is properly attached to your hoist or your center jack or whatever you're using because it can upset the, the center of balance of the vehicle, like how it's sitting on your hoist. I already have this one ratchet strapped around, so it's good and firm. There's no problem there but I just wanted to mention, you wanna follow the service manual. So the next step is pulling off the front fender. We're gonna use that quarter inch Allen bit. All right, so the front fork legs are free. We could just use this quarter inch Allen bit to go in, loosen up all of the pinch screws. There's two on the bottom, and then one up on the top, and the fork leg will come out. But before we do that, I'm gonna use the 12 millimeter Allen key bit that we made. Stick it up through the bottom. I'm gonna remove these screws and let the oil drain into the drain pan. It just makes it a little bit easier for my setup. So let's do that. I like to try to get most of the fork oil out before I pull everything all apart. It just makes it easier, easier for me. So with the screws removed, the fork sliders can move pretty much effortlessly. I'm just gonna reach up in through the top and grab the retaining ring very carefully. You don't want to accidentally gouge your fork tube. We'll just pull it out like that. 
the reassembly is going to be in a slightly different order, but these pieces won't be reused since we have the fork rebuild kit, so I'm not worried about bending them at all. Just FYI. So now that we have the retaining rings removed, along obviously with the screws to hold the fork assembly together, I'm going to use the fork itself as a little slide hammer to drive the top fork seal and the top fork bushing out of the fork tube. This garbage can is lined with rags, so in case I drop something, it'll just fall into a nice soft bin of rags. There you go. Now I'm going to set this off to the side so that we can clean it up and inspect all these components here in a minute. All right, let's do the exact same thing with this other fork slider. Again, I'm just going to take it off to the side, spray it out with our multi-purpose solvent and compressed air. Well, now we need to pull the actual fork assembly off the vehicle. So we're going to use that quarter inch bit and we're just going to loosen up both bottom screws. Just like that. And then once we go to loosen up the top screw, the whole fork assembly is going to slide out. So we're going to be prepared for that. I'm going to hold the fork assembly while we loosen the top screw. And then everything will pull right out. Let's go toss it on the table. Then let's do the exact same with this other fork assembly. So this is what my setup looks like. If you haven't done front forks before, it's, I'm sure it's easiest just to do one fork leg at a time. You know, remove it, disassemble it, install the new stuff, and then stick it back up in the bike and then do the other side. But I like doing both at the same time, just that way I'm using the same tools just back and forth. But you want to keep each side by itself so that it goes back up in the same side of the front fork. The front fork lowers are different, so you can't switch them around. But you could potentially switch these parts. But you're just better off just putting the left side back in the left side and the right side back in the right side. So the next thing that I do is we're going to remove the top fork cap. There are a lot of safer ways of doing this. This just happens to be the way that I'm doing it. The front fork spring is under a lot of pressure. If you're using this method, you just want to make sure that you don't have any tools pointed like directly towards your face or else that could be a problem. So we have a clean drain pan. Everything's all good there. We have our 19 millimeter Allen socket on top of our impact set to reverse. I do it just like this. You can do it any way that you like. My drain pan is very flexible, so it can like bottom out, and I just use my stomach to compress the front fork spring as everything's coming apart. And then I take all the parts of the front fork tube. Flip it inside out. Let's do the other side too.
I like to get my favorite penetrating oil, spray down the fork tube, and then wipe it clean before I just try to wipe all this dry dirt off. Because a lot of times a little bit of rust builds up here where it goes through, where it goes through the lower tree. And then depending on the age and the condition of the bike, a lot of times it can be kind of pitted and rusted up here. And the penetrating oil helps to just bust all of that up before we just start scraping it all over uh, the fork tube. So you just spray a little bit of the towel. And then clean your tube. You can see that there was some rust on there. We're gonna go through and spray it down with a multi-purpose solvent, ultimately in the end before we put all new pieces together. I just like to do this part first so that, that we aren't like contaminating the inside with that, with that dirt and rust. And then we'll lay one of the fork tubes down. You wanna lay it down on something soft because you don't wanna mess up this finish and have it damage your new fork seal. That would be a real bummer. So you just kind of move your bushings up. So you just move your bushings up till you have room. You grab a flathead screwdriver and then spread the lower bushing a little bit. It'll slide right off. This one is still in pretty good shape. It's starting to wear down just a little bit, but it is in really good shape. Like we could definitely reuse that if we wanted to, but we're already in here. We might as well just use new components. And then the fork seal, you can slide it one way and then the other way and I'll pull off the bottom. I'm just gonna take these and toss them in the garbage. And then we're gonna do the exact same thing with the left side or with the other side, the right side in this particular situation. You could slide the seal and all those parts up, or you can slide them down, it doesn't matter. So now I'm gonna use the multi-purpose solvent and compressed air to blow out the inside of the tubes and clean them out on the inside and the outside. And then I'm gonna clean up all of these components too. So let's do that, and I'll bring you back to a clean table with clean parts on it. All right, so we have everything all cleaned up now, the fork tubes, we have the tools ready that we're gonna use. And then we have the components laid out in basically the same way that they're going to go back together. And also per side. That's just the way that I like to do it. But let's take a closer look at our fork tubes. Now is a good time to inspect your fork tubes for any type of wear or burrs or damage. And even though these ones are the first time that they've ever been out of the motorcycle, you can see that they have like a little pinch line. I don't know if you can see that. But there's a little pinch line from where the triple trees and stuff come together. But we're gonna get it ready to put the bushings on it. And like I was talking about earlier, about burrs, you wanna be really careful about the top edge and make sure that it doesn't have a burr on it. And make sure that you don't have any kind of rust or corrosion that's gonna catch the new seal as you slide it on and damage everything. All right, so with it laying down, it's easier to see. Let's get our new fork kit opened up. And get our new parts ready. So, if you're using a, a fork rebuild kit, it comes with a new wear ring for the dampener tube. You typically want to keep the grooves going in the same direction. Like you can see that it's pretty important the way that it's designed, how it has like little opening gaps here towards the bottom. So we're going to pop that thing off. Grab our new one. Have the little gaps towards the bottom, so that's looking good. 
And then at this point, I like to prep our bolt and our washer. So I get this little cut off Allen key, slides in there, take the pipe dope. I like to visually confirm that there's a fat bead all the way around just so there's no gaps. Slide the washer on. Then I kind of push it into that bottom bead and then start a top bead just like that. And then I wipe off the excess for the time being. If any more squeezes out, when we go to put it in the fork, I will, I'll wipe that excess off then. And especially if you have any damages on the fork too, like rust or corrosion or a nick or a burr, anything that's going to interfere with the new fork seal sliding over it and damaging it. And honestly, even if the bike has more than just five or 10,000 miles, I just naturally do this. But I make like a little fork seal protector out of the bag that everything comes in. And I'll show you how I use that in a second. So we'll get our first fork bushing. And this is the bottom most one. You can see that it's a little bit wider, a little bit bigger, but it goes down here at the bottom. You don't want to spread this open any more than you have to. Like you don't want to put a flathead screwdriver in there and spread it open or anything. Just use a little bit of fresh fork oil. Then get your fork tube, slide it on, and that's it. And then you'll grab your upper fork bushing, same thing. Grab a little fork oil. Lube up the inside of your bushing and the outside. Slide it over everything. And then there's a top washer to pound everything all together. It's stamped out of like a sheet of steel, so there's one side where it's kind of rolled over and another side where it's flat. I guess I like to put the flat side down. It doesn't really matter, but style points, I guess. And then since we have fork oil on our hand, now's a good time to get the O-ring off our top cap. And then we want to lube up our new O-ring. Put it on here. Make sure it sits down in that groove. There's a special little groove for it. And then you want to lube your threads too. Like you don't want the threads to be dry as you're putting it back together. So now it's time for the fork seal. Fork seal has a special way to go in. It has these little dual dots on the top side and on the bottom it has the gator spring. So same thing, I get fresh fork oil, put it in there, lube it up, and then over here I'll show you what I do with this. So I take the bag, I put it over like half of it, you can probably see, and then and then I just make it real tight. Like I choke up on it. And then a fork seal will go over the top of it, and then you just kind of work it over the bag. And then like this. You can slide the whole bag down over any affected areas of rust and corrosion. And then once you get it down to the bottom where you need it to be, you just kind of spin it off. And then you have your fork seal back into position exactly where it needs to be with no rips or tears. So this is all set to go. So next to the overall assembly, we have, well, we have the bushings on, the top washer, the seals on, in the correct direction. Everything has a little bit of oil on it. 
We'll take our dampener tube. Again, put a little bit of fresh oil on our new wear ring. It'll slide in. And then I'll pop out the bottom just like that. And then our fork spring will go in for just the time being. We'll just stick it in there. It'll help us assemble everything. And again, the, the fork spring and this little tube will come back out before we fill it up with oil. Just saying. So I like to make sure that the fork, I like to oil the outside of the seal too. Like when you take apart older fork tubes, the bore on the inside of it, it can get super corroded from, I'm sure, water that sits down in there and works its way in. But I just like to, I don't know, lube it up. It makes it a little bit easier. And then I also, I saw another technician doing this where the gaps are. I like lining the gaps up. So essentially the gaps will not be on a thrust surface. I'm sure it doesn't make a difference. When you pull them apart, they come apart in all different directions, just like piston rings. But just a little added attention to detail. So I'm going to put my gaps right there on top. And then just so I can see it once I assemble everything. Because this bottom one won't really move. Like it will stay with a fork too. This top one will spin around until it gets installed. So we'll just line them up like that. I'll line them up like that so when I go to pound everything together I can keep them in kind of in phase together if that makes any sense you see so there's the line that I made and it corresponds to the way that I'm going to install all of this together before we put it in we don't want to forget this part slides on just like that we'll slide it into our fork assembly it's easiest to do this while it's all upright, so I'm going to pull the camera back and, and actually do it while it's upright. Alright, so I have the indexing line that I, just, that I just made. And then our two bushing lines are lined up with that. We have the top piece on. Everything's together in good shape there. And like I was saying, I like to keep the gaps on the non-thrust surface side. So basically the side that's opposite from where the reflector is. And you just drop it on over. Just like that. And then you'll use a little pick to line everything up. And then We'll take our new screw and a new seal washer that's already pipe doped. Stick that in the bottom. Before I torque it down, I'm gonna flip it over. I'm going to use the seal driver to test the seal in. And then put the retaining ring in. All right, the retaining ring is fully in the groove. I don't know if it'll show up. But everything is assembled perfectly there. I'm gonna flip it back over. Grab the impact. And now I like to tighten down the actual bolt at the bottom. On our torque sheet, 
we already know that it's going to be the fork slider assembly screw. So for me, it's 30 to 37 foot pounds. I'm going to give it just a little, just a couple clicks with the impact to make sure everything seats correctly. And then I'm going to use a long screwdriver to get through where the fender goes and torque it down. Turn the torque wrench on. Might as well just go to 37. Perfect. Now we're going to pull the top spacer back out back in line and we're going to pull the spring back out so right now the fork assembly is completely rebuilt with all new parts with all new wearable parts and it's prepped and ready to be set for the fork oil height I'm going to do both fork oil heights at the same time so now I'm just going to speed up and do the other fork tube and get that one all together. So now our fork assemblies are completely put together with the seals, the bushings, everything's tightened down. We just have to add the oil and bleed the air out. Our particular kit calls for 110 millimeters of air. Essentially I have my digital caliper set to 110 millimeters. So that means this is 110 millimeters. So I loosen up the screw, the adjustment screw and then butt it up to the end of my measuring stick essentially and that is now 110 millimeters so we're going to fill this thing up with fork oil and bleed the air i'm going to stick this in and suck out all the oil until it's to the very tip of this let me show you that our particular kit is set to 110 millimeters because that's what wilbur's instructed us to do it's it shows on the front of the box 110 and they also write it in the instructions 110 millimeters so you could add a little bit more or remove a little bit to change the way the suspension feels but they said 110 so that's what we're doing all right we have our fork standing up the tube is completely depressed it doesn't have the spring in it or the washer or the top collar it just has the dampener tube down in there. You can't see it. So what we're gonna start off by doing is adding a bunch of oil to it. And 
And then there's going to be a bunch of recesses in there where there's little air pockets. So we want to bleed all of that out. I like to pump it up and down like this and spin it in a circle. I feel like that does a good job. You can hear it sucking the air out. We already know it's going to be 110 millimeters down, so that's somewhere in this area. So we might as well keep the oil up about that level. I like to keep the fork tube nice and clean because it's going to have a little residual oil from assembly. And after you do that a bunch of times, I don't know, 20 or 30 times, then they want you to degas it. So that's where you draw a little bit of a vacuum up on the tube just by hand. I'll show you how to do that. I'm going to reposition this. All right, so we, my setup down here is I just have it on a little soft cloth with a long screwdriver down through the bottom. So I can stand on it like this and pull up on it. And it'll stay there. It's got a bunch of oil in it. And then the way to degas it is with the tube all the way down. Put your hand over the top. You'll pull up on the tube. I'll draw a vacuum inside like that. You do this 20 times, it said. All right, that looks pretty good. So now the idea is to make sure that the fork oil is 110 millimeters down from the top, leaving us with 110 millimeters of air. So you do this with the fork tube completely collapsed all the way down. No spring in it, no nothing. Well, just the oil. And then you insert the tool and then suck out the excess oil. So now we know that there's 110 millimeters of free air in it. So I'm going to get ready to install everything because now's the time. All right, so the way that I do this is I extend the fork tube so it's extended then we're going to drop in the fork spring with the progressive coils at the top and then the stock little washer and then this little spacer tube deal 
And again, it's easier if, if you have two people, one to help you compress the thing and the other person to help turn this top screw that we're about to do. But since I'm down here by myself, I'm gonna use the impact just to spin it very, very lightly. And I'm gonna use my stomach to compress everything. Hopefully that came through pretty clear, but I wasn't using the impact action of the impact. You want to be very careful to not cross thread the top screw. It's pretty easy. It's a fine thread screw, but if you do, you're in for a bad time. So you want to be very careful. I'm going to stick the fork tube up through the lower triple tree. I'm going to tighten down the lower pinch bolt. And then that'll give me enough room to get my torque wrench and my Allen up in there to torque down the top cap. And then we'll slide it in the rest of the way till it's home. I'm gonna stick it up just like that far. You don't need to crank these bolts down, just a little snug because these only go to 18 foot-pounds anyway. And then I should still be able to stick my tool up in there. And then we're just going to go to full lock on the handlebar. Tighten it down pretty easy. I'm going to loosen these screws back up. And then send the fork all the way at home. So the fork tube does slide up through the top a little bit. For me, it's usually about the thickness of a nickel. So that's what I do. I just slide this back edge up the thickness of a nickel. And then we're gonna torque the top and the two bottom bolts here to 18 foot pounds. All right, that's one good completed fork tube assembly. Everything's all done. It's all torqued down in the triple tree. Let's go back. I'm gonna set the fork oil on that one, purge the air out of it, do the exact same process. So I'm just gonna speed up through it and shove it back up in there, tighten everything down.
All right, now we're ready to slide this one up through the lower triple tree. And on this side, I have the fork lock set. So it gives me this wide open area to work. All right, so both fork tubes are fully assembled, fully tightened down in the lower triple tree. Now just the reassembly is the reverse of earlier, putting everything back together, torquing it down, putting the fender on, then the wheel, axle, calipers, and then I'm just gonna speed up through this, do a little time lapse, and come back together, and we'll start on the rear. All right, now that the front's completely installed, I switched up the bike to a conventional hoist just because it's easier to do rear shocks like this. I'll easily be able to lift up the rear end of the vehicle right here. So we have the new shock absorber. This is the conventional side. It comes on the right side of the vehicle and then the LDC goes on the other side. It was very specific. The instructions were very specific about how to install the LDC in which direction. It didn't mention about the conventional shock, so I'm going to install it with the Wilbur's label pointing that direction. But it's pretty straightforward. It just uses, uses a three quarter inch socket and I'm just going to lift up the vehicle until I can slightly spin the tire just to get the weight off the suspension. We'll pull these two screws 
replace this shock, and then we'll go over to the left hand side and then put the LDC on. So let's get to going. I'm going to remove the shock on the other side at this point in time just to make it easier. I'll just get both shocks off. The instructions were saying that if the shocks aren't the same length that's perfectly normal because it's like a completely different deal. So I'm going to get the top bolt started and then we're going to lift up the motorcycle until I can get the bottom bolt in, tighten it down, and then we'll go do the same thing on the other side. Alright, now we're here on the left hand side of the bike. The instructions were specific about the ZF logo pointing towards the front of the vehicle. It's looking pretty good. Let's get some Loctite on those screws and get the shock in. Alright, so now that we have the LDC shock installed on the left hand side and the regular conventional shock right here on the right hand side, we're going to do the sag adjustment. In this you only need to do once. That's the beauty of this whole system is that the LDC will compensate for any type of added weight from a rider or a tour pack after this initial setup is done. So what we're going to do is we're going to first start out with the rear tire suspended so there's no weight on the shocks as you can see the rear tire moves freely and then you can use anything to measure but I've just made this little magnet and a socket and our sag adjustment is going to be three quarters of an inch so it's right there on the ruler I have it so it just slides right on the bottom shock bolt and you can kind of see through the center of the top now what we're going to do, we're going to lower the vehicle down so that the suspension is under the normal weight of the vehicle. And then we'll have the rider hop on it and we should be able to do the sag adjustment. And if we need to do anything, we'll use the spanner wrench to do it.
So now the suspension is under the weight of the vehicle. Let's get in a little bit closer. And then we're gonna have Dale hop on the motorcycle. Dale, ready the motorcycle. All right, I'm gonna move you out of the way just so I can see a little bit. So the sag adjustment is already set. It might be a little bit different through the camera, but it's already at three quarters of an inch of sag. Uh, already preset, we didn't have to do anything. But let's see how the suspension is gonna compensate. We're gonna have Amanda hop on the back and I'm gonna cycle the suspension just by pushing up and down on the fender to simulate bumps. So if you would like to hop on, All right, so just for comparison, just so that we know measurements, it looks like it squatted down maybe half an inch. So here we go. Everybody hold on, make motorcycle noises if you want. <laughs> I could feel it move. All right, so just in those few movements, we've seen that it's come up a quarter of an inch. Let's do this more. Some more bumps. Yeah, exactly. All right, that was exhausting. <laughs> that was it though, like it literally, it came all the way up. Yeah. All right, so just under that little bit of suspension travel, you can tell that it's fully popped back up with the weight of the rider and the new passenger on it. So that's pretty sweet, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. All right, we're here with Dale, he's the service manager here at Arsenal Harley-Davidson. This is his Street Glide Special that we put the LDC and the Wilbur suspension kit on. He's been running it around for a week now with the tour pack and his wife, and let's hear your experience. Well, as I said, when we were setting this up last week, uh, stock suspension took a lot of playing with to get it to where I felt was comfortable, but nowhere near what this is. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I had a feeling it was to be better, but leaving here, I wasn't a mile down the road. I can tell the difference in the way the suspension pumped up. Um, once I hit the freeway at higher speeds, uh, the bike was like it was on rails. It rode and handled beautifully. I got home that night, put the turret back on, threw my wife on, and it wasn't maybe a mile to two miles down the road. My wife leaned over and said, I don't know what you did, but it was money well spent. It was the smoothest thing. It pumped up immediately. You can tell the difference as you're riding when you first put all the weight in. Um, it's smooth. It takes bumps. It takes those uh, high spots in the road when there are a lot of them in a row and just smooths it right out. Not like they're gone, but uh, night and day difference. It is a pretty, pretty impressive setup. I really like the simplicity of it. Yep. And I really like how it's just one and done. You yeah. set it, forget it, and then you don't have to worry about switches or buttons or tubes or, you know, adjustments and knobs and all that business. Yeah. So. yeah, every time I put my wife on the back with the turret pack loaded and going off for a nice long ride, I had to sit and crank it up, and I did find my two locations of where I wanted it, where I rode solo, where I rode loaded up. But uh, I don't have to do that now. I can literally just put her on and go. It's a world of difference. I'll put the phone number to the dealership down in the description. So if you have any questions about this Wilbur's LDC setup or any other type of suspension, feel free to give Dale a call and he'll let you know what's going on with it. Awesome. Thanks for watching, like, and subscribe.